and it actually takes you to their archive, their code collection archive. And in here, the first thing they have is they have a section on builders. And in this case, I've grabbed the Yashima ransomware builder. So you can grab it from right here. I mean, I literally just clicked here and downloaded it, right? And so you can too, by the way. I'm sure that you give general disclaimers like this to your wider Don't followers. Don't actually be a cyber criminal. <laughs> so anyways, we have Lockbit here, the biggest group out right now. The biggest, and I'll call it again, legitimate ransomware group. Alrighty, how's it going, everyone? Hey, this is pretty awesome. I am stoked to be hanging out with a dear friend of mine, uh, and we're getting a little bit more time to banter and uh, riff back and forth. But Ryan, Ryan Chapman, it's so good to see you, dude. And uh, how are you doing? What are you up to? What's on in your world these days? <laughs> I'm good. I'm working a lot less these days, meaning I'm not working seven days a week, 12 plus hours a day. And that Really refreshing. <laughs> well, hey, let so. me sing your praises for a little bit, if I may, because uh, I think you're doing some super cool threat intelligence these days, a little bit of malware analysis, hey, diving into some ransomware gangs and uh, teaching over at SANS, doing some education and training and all that. Uh, I'll, hey, man, I'll let you take it over. <laughs> yes. So day job, I work as an incident response consultant. So we're the crews that get called in when things go wrong, when the proverbial hits the fan, you know? And on the side, if you can call it the side, because you know, multiple full-time jobs, <laughs> I work as a SANS author and instructor. So I've authored, it, as you know, since you were there and you helped me out with it, and it was awesome, SANS Forensics 528, Ransomware for Incident Responders. And so it's a four-day course that is 100% ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. Although I don't have to tell you too much about it because you helped me out. Thank you very much for folks watching here. John showed up for our alpha. So we had an invite only alpha course and I was like, I want that guy. And so he came in and gave a, gave a bunch of really, really cool feedback and just really helped out. And then we met up shortly after at uh, DEF CON in August of uh, 22, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good times. Good seeing you again also. <laughs> I'm excited to uh, nerd out one more time for uh, DEF CON 31 coming up pretty soon, right? Yes. Let's do oh, it. I'll be there. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, man, I wanted to give you the spotlight. I would love to let you, if you're all right with it, maybe light off some fireworks, do some show and tell. Uh, I'd love to see some whatever live demos or anything that you just think is pretty sweet to dig into with ransomware. <laughs> yes. So you and I have been talking about builders for a while now. And, you know, quick background for the audience and your watchers. You know, ransomware has evolved over time. The initial version of ransomware that recognized, at least, was distributed via floppy disks, like literally like, you know, wobble, wobble. Floppy disks, five and a quarters, uh, back in 889 slash 90, basically. And following that, we have this evolution where we had human operated ransomware or humor, as we call it. It's not humorous, but you know, we call it humor. And then we got to ransomware as a service. And so that's basically a turnkey solution where you have an entire ecosystem of developers who build the core product, basically. They develop the ransomware, they build the infrastructure to allow it to communicate, so on and so forth. And then they essentially lease that out, typically via affiliate programs. So some groups like Vice Society is one group that goes after higher education organizations primarily. I'm cute, right? They claim to be a group of friends and that they don't use affiliates. But many of the larger group names that we're all familiar with, Lockbit, Black Pasta, you know, whatever it may be, they use these affiliate programs. And so the developers basically just build out a certain version or you know, versions of their malware, of the ransomware cryptor or encryptor itself, and they provide that to the affiliates. The affiliates then go do all their dirty deeds. So they sometimes call themselves pin testers on the dark forums. But what I want to focus on are the, those builders. Like, how is the ransomware built out? So uh, you were mentioning that you did a video and uh, on Lockbit uh, RSC. You were talking about writing an, an article on one, right? And so I had a uh, with, with Lockbit 3.0, their little code black or whatever had had leaked. Um, I had shared on Twitter. I didn't get a chance to make a video on it, but I would love to kind of see the thing in action, other than just single like pictures that I shared on Twitter. Um, but yeah, between Conti, between I think Babook right? Was there another ransomware gang? Yep. I might be getting the name wrong. Uh, but there are so, so many. And it's just wild to me how commoditized it's become. Like it's a push button, easy hacking when you have builders just like this. So, so the first thing I want to show you is this tool called Raznet, right? So this is a builder for ransomware that is open source. And I'll zoom in a little bit for you here. There you go. So here's Raznet, for528.com slash Raznet, R-A-A-S for ransomware as a service net. The original repo was taken down. However, the original contributor, that guy right there, has actually been contributing to this repo. And for whatever reason, as of this recording, at least, 
it's still up. So let's go with it. This is actually the first lab from my SANS class, right? We talk about RASNet. Well, you and I are just going to go fart around with it, basically. We're just going to go build some ransomware, right? So this one is fairly unique in that it builds out a Python script. The Python script is then pushed in through uh, PyBuilder. Is it PyBuilder? What's the uh, PyInstaller? PyInstaller, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it creates an executable. So let me kill this guy and that guy. I was already playing around with some things. So check this out. We're going to go just into Windows Terminal. And you'll see that we have here, we're in the folder called RASNet No Login. And what I've done, there's a version of RASNet that requires logging in to the infrastructure, but it didn't work very well in a class setting. And also, I don't always want to log into things, right? I just want to use it. So we we made a slightly modified version, and we're just going to launch it with Python and do RASNet, no login. Now, I'll tell you right now, the color scheme is a bit off-putting, and that's coming from a colorblind person. So just, <laughs> just a heads up on that. Even I'm like, ooh. I'm digging the okay. Guy Fox anonymous mask, all gangster yeah. here. Yeah, Check him out, right? He's like, uh, okay, you're cool, buddy. So this tool was designed and very, very similarly to what we call a dashboard in the, the RAS ecosystem. The dashboard is provided by the developer to the various affiliates and it allows them to get eyes on the prize, if you will, of who they've attacked successfully. And for that matter, usually to go build out their ransomware. And that's what we're doing. So in this case, we're going to log in with whatever, because we're not really logging in. We're just going to bypass that. And here's the generator. So this one's called a generator. The typical term is builder, though, right? So in here, we can start the server. And if I start the server, I'll zoom in a little bit. This little guy likes to run on this default port 8989. And again, the color scheme with the text on the you know, whatever gray, blue, whatever that is, whatever. So the key server idea is more for old school symmetric key ransomware. And that's when ransomware would primarily have a single key that it would utilize to encrypt and decrypt, which, as you know, most groups have moved far beyond that to public key encryption. However, in this case, the overall idea of running this key server is that when the actual ransomware runs during runtime, during execution on the victim machine or machines, it will generate a key and it sends that key over to the key server, uses it to encrypt the files, and then it tosses it from memory, basically. So we have a key server running, and this is as simple as it is. This is how legit ransomware, if, if there's such a thing as legit <laughs> ransomware, yeah. right? <laughs> the most minute. official cybercrime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is is generated, is created. So I go over here to like uh, generate payload, and I get my generation screen. And it's as simple as this. Let's get this guy minimized for now. So here's an example. And this is an open source generator, right? However, something that I actually show in the class. This exact version of ransomware, this family, which again is open source, and the, I know the guy who wrote it. Well, I've talked to him online a number of times. I don't know him, but you know, my online buddy, I, uh, he's talked about how basically he designed it to look exactly like the real generators. And his whole thing is let's just get people trained on, on how these things really work. And many people see this and think, well, this is too easy. It's, it's just a GUI, right? So the easy. Crap, yeah. And it really is like we have these settings. I'll, I'll leave it set to GUI mode because then it, you can make some pretty ASCII art, basically. And in here, I can choose the encryption type. All right, I'll leave it alone. There's some options here. And these some builders, actual ransomware group builders, per se, um, include these. Right. And there was one group, by the way, that we mentioned in class that was using this builder. And they were trying to get people to basically become insider threats. So they were sending out mouse spam campaigns saying, hey, you want to make a couple million bucks kind of thing. And then but the little screenshot that they gave as an example of like what they'll provide to you to then inject into your own company was this exact tool. Oh, I was like, gosh. oh, you got that from GitHub. Get out of here. <laughs> All right. So um, something important here is the encryption methodology override and rename basically means the files read into memory. The memory, the contents in memory are then encrypted. And then the encrypted contents are written right back to that same file using usually the same file handle. Essentially, the artifact in NTFS or for that matter, inode and, and ext, whatever um, file system, right, does not change. The file itself just is overwritten with the new data, right? Forensically, that's different from analyzing copy and remove. So this is kind of the older way, but sometimes we still see this these days, and it, it's kind of useful for us to maybe help recover some stuff. So copy and remove, what it does when it's running is it takes the file that it wants to encrypt, right, as it, it's looping through all the folders and whatnot. 
it grabs the file, it copies it to a new location, and then it basically, you know, after it reads the contents from the unencrypted file, writes the encrypted data, and then it deletes the old file. But for those familiar with forensic analysis, you can potentially then carve the data off okay. of the disk yeah. because it's not been deleted. It's just been marked as deleted, you know, in the master file table, like in, in Windows, for example. So oftentimes override and rename is, is the option they'll go with. And it's as simple as this. Custom message. Boom. We can make a custom message. Tango so down. Let's, <laughs> let's make a uh, a custom message. What are we going to do here? I have a cute little Ask Your Generator. So John, John and Ryan's ransomware. <laughs> oh, what, are, what are we going to call it? What is it? Ron, Giant. How do we combine amalgamation of our <laughs> name? <laughs> the Ron ransomware. <laughs> the Ron team. Done. <laughs> So the Ron team is going to come in. We're going to grab this, ask you, let's see if it, boom, the Ron team Wolf sucks pack. for you, right? And then basically <laughs> this is where you put in your ransom note, you know, contact us via talks or via tour or go to this dot onions, you know, whatever it may be, right? Email us at this proton, you know, <laughs> mail, whatever yeah. is usually how they do it. So let's just, we'll just put this it sucks for you in our ask your the Ron team. And then we save it. Message saved, right? We can do a custom image so that when the ransomware runs, it actually populates an image onto the screen and executable runs and literally shows it. Um, I'll leave off the image for right now and use the default. So this is then where you can usually, in a builder, choose the directories or the extensions. So if I go to directories, we can choose which directories we want to target. We can give it a location to start. In this case, we can say home, which is going to be the user's home drive. Now, if I go like this, and I were just to go to, for example, users and uh, go look in here. Home is going to be our no ransom user. So then from here, let me make this guy a little bit bigger. There you go. You know, what do you want to encrypt? Like, well, I'll go into, let's do encrypt documents. All right. And then there's some stuff in documents. Like there's Rasnet master. I made a copy of Rasnet and I put it in documents. But what if we actually call this like development? Pretend that's development documents, right? They're not. It's, it's actually Raznet. It's the ransomware itself. But we're going to tell the ransomware to encrypt its own source code because that's just funny to me. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So we go like this. Let's just only target whatever's in documents, which, by the way, will also grab, you know, these, some of the other things. Yeah. yeah, right. But we'll go ahead and, you know, development will be caught up in that. So I save it. And then file extensions. This is basically where you are setting an allow list, right? Um, so the allow list of things that should be encrypted. And we can add some, for example, to hit maybe like target development environments. You know, MD, PY, those things may not actually be there. YAML. So we can add those like YAML, yet another markup language, encrypt it. Python files, encrypt them. Markdown files, encrypt them. And I hit save. And that's mostly it. As soon as I hit generate, now this tool is different because it was designed to literally just build out a Python-based executable. And by the way, that is not unheard of these days with legit... I keep saying it. I should stop saying that, John. <laughs> legit legit ransomware. Ransomware. <laughs> But it says, hey, I made these scripts. And I say, okay. So what I can do is I can go and look at the scripts that were just generated. So I go, oh, no. Day one. Ignore my dirt folder. Derp. Derp. <laughs> Derp. And I go right here, date modified. Here's what it just made, right? So what, it, what does it look like? Well, I go look at the payload.py and it's just a simple Python script. We have our libraries that's going to be pulling in here and crypto is obviously <laughs> fairly important. Hey, look, there's a hint right there. Um, I can change the name of the window title in this regard. Now, notice the builder didn't actually have that for us, but we can put that in there like yeah. rut row, something like that. We could change colors by just, you know, putting some things in, in here. This, the photo code, I didn't choose a custom image, but this is going to be the actual image that displays when the ransomware runs. Some ransomware shows an image, some ransomware changes the desktop to, you know, whatever they want to show you. And some just drops the readme files in like every darn directory that it touches, you know, or, and some are all the above. So I can scroll down past that. This is an example of ransomware in Python, and it shows just how simple it really is. Right. There's a timer that runs after the ransomware runs to kind of give you, you know, psychological pressure. Right. And so that's what this part's about. Um, it has, it's multi threaded. So it has threading in here, but really the way it works out is pretty darn easy. There's a function here that basically grabs the individual item that's being provided to it and then runs the encryption. This is an example of using a proper crypto library. Some groups like Beyond Leon 
is a, a group that the redacted team and my buddy Danny Quiss, shout out to Danny. What's up, man? They wrote some articles on the Beyond Leon crew and they basically rolled their own crypto. They tried to make the encryption algorithm and library stuff themselves and integrate their own code base to it. They made a boopy. Whoops. So I, I want to say it was the Sophos folks and I'll have to, I'll have to update in a, you know, in the YouTube comments if I if got that one wrong. There's a team that basically released a decryptor for their stuff. They're like, oh, they, they did a boo boo. They actually included apparently the private keys in the builds. Ooh. <laughs> it's just, yeah, kind of a Whoops. no-no when you yeah, defeat the purpose of public private key encryption, but whatever. So here you have your examples of the files themselves being uh, read and then the data being encrypted and then that data being written to the file, right? Simple as that. And then you have like the key server stuff is down here. Here's our list of extensions that we're going to basically take. So this is our allow list. And then look, oh, look at here's our ASCII <laughs> art right there. Sucks for you. And in this case, I probably should have started the build before. I'm going to not save that and just close that and then go back into our little guy over here. Next, you would say compile payload. And then I would just click finish, basically. I could provide a custom icon if I wanted to, but I just basically tell it like, yeah, go ahead and make it happen. So I hit finish and in the background here, it's now building. Now, the reason this is going to take a while to build is it's you, it's literally using Pi installer. You can see it right there on the screen. Right. So it's using Pi installer with a Python 379 framework, and it's going to package up a cute little .exe file for us. Threat actors are starting to do this because when you use something like Pi installer, or for that matter, when you use like Go or Rust or something like that, you have options sometimes to include the runtime and those run, or maybe you have to, and mm -hmm. the runtimes included along with the uh, bytecode, whatever is going to be compiled down to the intermediate language. It's usually bigger. It's a bigger file. And for some odd reason, that bypasses some EDRs. And for that matter, they just see Python running and they're like, oh, it's just Python. Oh, it's Python, cool. whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, let's go. And then it has to rely on heuristic detections to potentially be like, wait, it's interacting with these folders and, and like, that's not right, you know, kind of thing. So in this case, it's building out the executable. I think it's just about to finish. So we'll just let that one keep running for a bit and minimize this for now, or better yet, just maximize this guy. It also created a decryptor and the decryptor is beyond simple. <laughs> so we're ready to say beyond, beyond. So it just creates a little window and it goes, hey, give me the key. Now, that's the trick with the older versions of ransomware is that you would have to have that key in order to put it in and for it to be successful, essentially. Right. So if you were to run one of these old school decryptors and I say, yeah, go ahead and make the decryptor also. Right. So now it's going to build that in the background. If I were to run a decryptor and it asks me for a key. Right. And some decryptors provided these days also function this way but you put the wrong key in. It doesn't have checks and balances to go look at the files it's going to identify, all right, based on the ransomware family that, oh, this was this has been encrypted by us. Let's go decrypt it. It doesn't look to see like, okay, good. Did I regenerate the original data? It doesn't do that. It just runs a decrypt routine. So you have to make sure it's the right key, essentially. So that's, that's basically it. At this point, we have our server, right? I think that I already have it running. Please hold. I do. So yep. we have our key server right here. And if I wanted, I can honestly just go over here. It's blown and up. I can dude. go into the disk directory and I have my decryptor and I have my payload. Notice the payload is like 23 megabytes. That's a big boy. Well, right? That's yeah, big. Yeah. Uh, but if I take these out, just pop them on the desktop. These are our RASNet built ransomware and then the associated decryptor. Right. And if I go into documents and we're looking here in development, notice we have files, like a Python file. It's still a Python file currently, right? But if I run this payload, like literally if I just go boop and I double click on it, shortly after, I will not have the regular file. Oh, oh the RON team. No, I it forgot to wrong. change the uh, the text type. I was supposed <laughs> to change the font from Helvetica to... Uh, Monospace. To oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Ryan. We're not oh, legit so ransomware gang. Is it? We're not a legitimate... <laughs> yeah, look at that. Without that, oh, no. This is all for naught. Okay, so you get our, our little timer and all that. You close it, and now look at your files. They're encrypted. Demon file. Oh, wow. Yeah, buddy. And that's also adjustable in, in many builders. Yeah, the yep. file name suffix and things like that. In this case, it wasn't, but I could have just edited the Python script before I built it, and it would work fine. So in this case, I see a readme dropped on the disk. I open it up, and at least here, yeah, got our mono space. Uh, anyway, sort yeah. of. Yeah. So sort of, our idea was better. Can we open up one of the encrypted ones? 
Yes, that's what I was going to do. Let's take a look here. So let's do it in, uh, oh, heck, let's just do it in Notepad. This was a README file, right? Originally. Now it ain't. <laughs> now it isn't. So at this point, we have that is encrypted. And if you were to run entropy on this, this is a very, very high entropy file because this particular encryptor encrypts the entire file, which not all builders do, by the way. Um, so in this case, if I wanted to get my data back and I can look over here at the key server and I can't see the text because it's going off the screen right now. But let me see if I can just do this. Oh, my key server didn't grab the key. Yeah, I didn't wow. see the number increment on top, but. No, not at all. Oh, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> That's cute. All right, anyway. So in this case, we have our data encrypted, but we want to decrypt it. Now, here's the fun part. We actually didn't get the key, so we're not going to be able to decrypt it. Yeah. Oh, how you fun is that? Bail on that. <laughs> Yeah, that's odd. The key server was running. I didn't change any of the defaults and it just didn't want to grab it. All right, that's fine. Whatever, man, do you. So we don't get a key, no love. In this case, the data could still be up for sale or for extortion in these cases. And you may have a ransomware actor who's like, oh yeah, pay me the money. And you pay him and you don't even get the key. This is actually kind of a real world situation, which does suck, by the way. So the next thing I was going to do is just show you to just run the decryptor and how the files get decrypted. But we didn't get any love with our key server on that one. Kinda I trust. Wondering. That's a little bit odd, right? We had it running. Should have been able to... Oh, I think I know why. Oh. There's why. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Networking is fully disabled. Yeah, I fully disabled Even it. for localhost? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the demo. Oops. I did that on purpose, but uh, a little backfire there. So, all right. So that's th that's just an example of a builder that's, you know, open source, right? Let's, uh, for now, I'll just put these in here. You go, the, go away. You can go grab. You can go download. You too can become a cybercrime ransomware operator. Speaking of which, if you just go to for528.com slash VXUG, you'll get this link to a phenomenal group of individuals called VX Underground. And it actually takes you to their archive, their code collection archive. And in here, the first thing they have is they have a section on builders. Yeah, just zoom in right there. There was this ransomware that was out for a while called Chaos. And then the new, a newer version of it, I want to say six, maybe it was eight, something like that. They changed the name, as the teams are known to do, to Yashima ransomware. And in this case, I've grabbed the Yashima ransomware builder. So you can grab it from right here. I mean, I literally just clicked here and downloaded it, right? And so you can too, by the way. I'm sure that you give general disclaimers like this to your wife. Don't followers. actually be a cyber criminal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't actually do that. Sure, you can download it. Don't download it on your work machine. Educational no. purposes only. Exactly. Yeah. So anyways, we have Lockbit here. The biggest group out right now, the biggest, and I'll call it again, legitimate <laughs> ransomware group, is Lockbit 3. They evolved from Lockbit 2, which evolved from Lockbit and so on and so forth. Pokemon evolutions. Yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. They're becoming Charmander to Charmeleon to Char <laughs> <laughs> Right? And so this builder was leaked, was it September? August, September of 22, yeah, September. right? I think yeah. it was. Yeah, someone uh, was a bit miffed or perturbed with them and leaked out their builder. And so it's the very common version of what's known as Lockbit Black. They have a couple others. They took, for example, the Conti code. Is Conti black or is that Lockbit green? I can't remember right now. I, I, I know the green is in the mix somewhere, and I think that's Conti related. What's Lockbit green? Yeah, Conti. Yeah. Okay, Conti was the green one. Thanks, Google. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, so let's go take a look at what these builders look like. We went a little slower with the first one. Here's the Yashima builder. This is literally what you would be provided as an affiliate, or in some cases, they would actually build it and then just provide the built materials to the affiliate. So here's Yashima. Again, cute little GUI, right? I can put my little notes in here. Let's try, let's try our thing again. Let's see, you go away. And we're going to go, I want to go over here, go to my ASCII art. Let's take our little guy right here. Let's drop it in there. Oh, we're not legit. We're not a legit. Sucks for us. <laughs> in this case, it sucks for us. <laughs> Our ASCII, my ASCII idea did not work as intended. That's okay. So in here, you can do things like randomize the file extension, right? I can change um, that option to rather use a certain extension, you know? Um, our RON team. So now every file is going to be .RON team kind of thing, right? Uh, or I can have it randomized. And so I can have over here, like spreading via local drives. Yeah. Okay. Sure. The process name when it actually runs. Let me zoom in a little bit. There you go. 
The process name when it runs, one of the defaults very commonly is servicehost.exe, which should be launched by services.exe and be a daemon handler for services running in Windows, but they launch and die and launch and die constantly. So threat actors like to hide with that particular name. You can change the name of the actual file that gets dropped onto the disk, the readme itself. So this sucks for us. No cool ASCII for raw team. Bad base. All right. I can also do things like go to file extensions and then in here, change the file extensions if I wanted to. And I can go over here to the decryptor and options and I can set, for example, deleting. Let me zoom in a little bit. Yeah, there you go. We can delete volume shadow copies. Ooh. We can delete the backup catalog. So the Windows backup, WBEM.exe usually handles those kind of things. Uh, Windows recovery mode. So just stop where, you know, recovery from occurring, disabling the task manager, and then stopping backup and anti malware services. This goes through a, a predefined list typically to try to kill the services so that they don't kill the ransomware, right? So in here, the way that you build out your uh, encryption mechanism with Yashma is you create the decryptor first. And it's, I need a name. Okay, decryptor name is uh, Ron Team Decrypt. And I create it, it goes, done. It's like, okay. So what it just did is it created a public and private key pair and it dropped them onto the disk. And so there's actually in here. There you go. Here's my private key, here's my public key, and there's the decryptor. You build the decryptor first. Kind of the opposite of what we just did with Raznik. Yeah. But now that we've done that, I can basically close these options. And now if I wanted to, I can go over here and choose build. And when I hit build, dun, 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 it's like, what do you want to call it? And I'm like, well, I'm going to call it. Um, it's a lot of times it'll be like the victim name or you know, something like that. We'll just call her as Ron Team. Just Ron, Ron Team. No, you know what? RT, lowercase. The actors oh, love man. single and two. Oh, have you been cute? <laughs> 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 what are you doing? No, you worked great last night. Why are you being a little fart? Oh, you don't you like see it? Sharp getting real angry. Wow. Yeah, look at it. What'd you do? Of course, whenever you try to demo something, that's awesome. All right. Well, you, my friend, are just going to go into the wind. That's so okay. I, I do tend to think, you know, uh, we get to a, a point where we say, yeah, all the ransomware builders are kind of the same. Kind of not, sometimes maybe, but basically the same functionality. I think it's really, really cool if you do want to pull open Lockbit or any of the others, uh, when you get some more of those customizable features, like with Yashima saying like, hey, let's rip those volume shadow copies right out of there. You know what? Let's stop the functionality of the recovery service or all those extra quality of life, if I may say, <laughs> uh, cybercrime tradecraft. That's the stuff that I think is just mind blowing to me. That's like, oh, we just uh, turn this false to a true or toggle that on with a little Boolean thumbs up or thumbs down. So I think that's wild. That note, let's do it. Let's look at Lockbit. So the Lockbit builder is different. The Lockbit, let me change the, the fonts here, the icons here. You have a build.bat file, which carries out the build operation, which is over here. We'll talk about it momentarily. You have the builder itself, which creates the actual ransomware. You have a separate key generator to build the public and private key pairs, and you can just keep cranking them out. And then you have your configuration file. And this configuration file is where you make your changes, basically your yeah. configurations, right? It's just simply in a JSON file, JavaScript object notation. So if we look here at the build.bat, what does this do? Right. The first thing it does is it clears out the contents of the build directory. So right here, if I were to go into build, it's empty right now, right? Cool. So it would make sure it's empty. Next, it runs the key gen and it creates a public key and a private key pair, right? It creates them for you and it drops them into the build directory. Okay. Then, and I'll put a little space here so we can kind of offset these. It runs the builder and it runs a multitude of, of types of things to build. One is it builds a decryptor. Then it builds four different types of encryptors. It creates an executable. It creates an executable that requires a password in order for it to run. And so that's kind of like if I build this guy here, right? LB3 underscore pass.exe. If I say that executable makes it up the virus total, but there's no other context about, you know, what uh. was, uh, how it was executed in a real environment, right? They wouldn't have that command line argument, the password to provide. And hopefully it's kind of anti tampering, anti analysis kind of thing. It also creates a DLL. So here's an encoding for DLL and then a password version of the DLL. 
And then finally, it also creates a DLL for reflective DLL injection, which is actually pretty cool. So perhaps in another video, we can talk about the actual malware analysis side of things after all the building is done, right? But in here, the builder just kind of does all the work. The key gen says, here's some new keys. And the builder says, got it. And it's pointed to those keys. And I see right here, here, use that key. And it goes, okay. And these all have a reference to the configuration JSON file, which obviously then we want to go look at it. So here it is. We have bot information up here for the universal ID or the key for association for affiliate credit kind of things, if you will. And then under config, here are our settings. And just like you said, you mentioned true and false. Bam, here's what we got. So our encrypt file name, do I want the actual file names to be changed or do I just want them to have, you know, suffix added kind of thing? Do we want impersonation with the user accounts involved during the context of execution? Do you want to skip hidden folders? The default is no, I don't want to skip hidden folders. Encrypt them too. This one's fun. You've seen these before, right? Language checks. Oh, yeah. So these will often look, sometimes they do it based on like the keyboards, the uh, layouts that are set in Windows oftentimes. And it's looking often for like acrylic types of languages. In other words, like Eastern Bloc, you know, uh, Europe stuff. And it, it goes, oh, wait a minute. Uh, that's potentially uh, a friendly. So we're just not going to, we're not going to. Friendly that. fire. Friendly fire. <laughs> yeah, friendly fire. So they'll put the, notice, I like the default is false on this one. I just noticed that. Uh, <laughs> do you want to encrypt local disks? Yeah. Do you want to encrypt network shares? By default, yeah, we do. Do you want to kill a multitude of, of processes and services in order to try to get us through? Um, let's see, what's a good one? Do you print note? <laughs> I'm actually not sure what that one particularly is because I just realized I have not seen Lockbit actually print out notes. The Royal Ransomware Group, for example, is one that's going on right now, and they actually have a feature to print the notes out, like on a printer. Like a oh. physical, real-world yeah. printer, you just get a ransom note. Just <laughs> Can you imagine oh. they just start laser copying around the place. <laughs> like what? Uh, set custom icons for things. Do you want to wipe free space? And this could be used for say that they, you know, there's a mechanism where they're deleting some files, or say that they have a file itself that may I don't know if it actually deals with slack space in the file, but overall free space. If the encrypted version is going to be less size, and, and just making sure there's no forensic ability to recover the data. And then, you know, do you want to try to spread via GPOs? You know, just build a GPO on the fly and just try to fire itself out. Do you want to try to spread across the network using PS exec, which basically is just SMB over named pipes, you know, using IPC shares and things like that. Uh, do you want to defeat, de defeat? What's this? Not a word. Do you want to delete event logs, right? Do you want to try to cover some of your tracks and, and things of that nature? And then we have the good old, they, they call it, these, these are their names, not mine. There are white folders and white files and white extensions. In other words, allowed folders, files, and extensions. Now, we see certain groups that have these types of things also in their data exfiltration tools. So I recently wrote an article on um, a tool called, wait for it, w1.ps1. And it's on the my company's blog. I'll digress for now. But if you go, because I'm not representing them, I'm representing just you and I, buddy. <laughs> and so anyways, uh, I gave a breakdown where they have listing of folders they're looking for. And the folders they're looking for for data exfiltration, instead of having like names like, you know, oh, I want to look at program data, I want to look at program, like something like that. They'll have names like, you know, uh, star taxes. And then also taxes, but in other languages. And they, you know that, that kind of thing to try to exfiltrate that data. And you have the same thing with the encryptors, basically, where you, you tell them what folders you really want and what you don't want to, uh, to encrypt. So you can set whitelisting and blacklisting of individual host names. And then here's that static list of processes and services I was talking about. So let's say that a threat actor is going into an environment and they know that that environment runs a, a given um, EPP, endpoint protection or EDR or whatever. They might throw a couple of those processes and service names in here in order to try to kill it off so that it doesn't kill your ransomware off. And then we have our gate URLs for reaching out and calling back. And then you have our impersonation accounts. If you're able to, you fill these out with accounts you've created within the environment, essentially. And then down here, we have our note. So this note here, we could essentially change this note to be, you know, whatever the heck we want. I guess we could try to put ASCII art. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's, don't even bother. <laughs> We're over it. We're over it. Yeah. So you could just be like, you know, Ron T. Hold on. Not on home row, <laughs> do a Ron team, got ya, you know, kind of thing. 
Um, you'll notice that some teams put very like verbose, detailed stuff in their readmes, and then others, it literally will be like locked by Team X and then an email address. <laughs> like, okay, <Owned. laughs> yeah, I guess I have to email you then. So this one's you know a little a little uh, a little complicated. You can just scroll on down. They're pretty the chest end. thumpy. They're like you know, come join us, change the world by free yeah. pen tests, <laughs> right? So we have our build stuff. And I'm just going to go over here, pop back a directory, and I'm just going to run the bat file. It's going to pop up and just run the commands, and then they'll just go away, and it runs in the background. It's already done. It's already built. This ransomware is built. We're not building using PyInstaller, which takes a long time. We're building using their own code building mechanisms. Some builders will take a skeleton or a structure of the entire portable executable, and it will include it in the builder, and then it will just manipulate the hex values where it needs to and then spit that out, save that to disk. Others actually do like a form of code compilation, although having the templates is a little more common. I'm not sure how Lockbit does it, but that's how Conti did it. Mm. So in this case, we have our decryptor. So if you've ever wondered, what does a Lockbit decryptor look like if you were to pay for it? You know, oh, it's teeny weeny, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just <laughs> a little guy, 55K, and it's what it looks like. And it's looking for known markers and files to identify that they have been encrypted by, in this case, Lockbit Black. And then it basically just starts enumerating and starts you know, unlocking the data, if you will. As a note, Lockbit is one of the fastest out there, if not the fastest out there, in terms of encryption and decryption. I don't know why I'm like advertising for them. <laughs> what am I talking about? Shut up. But the reason I mention that is because sometimes you'll have extremely slow, extremely slow decryption, even if you have the decryptor, and that's, that's never good. So in here, I get the passwords that are needed in order to execute. And I want to double click the wrong thing here. Here you go. So you get some instructions. This is, hey, when using uh, notes about safe mode, so on and so forth. And then it shows you if you're going to use the password version, here is oh, how you should do wow. it. That's the password that they generated. And if you don't have this and you just get a hold of that, like you as in you or me analysis right, right. wise, right? Um, this is also symmetric kind of stuff and it's gonna be very difficult usually to analyze the dang thing. You're not gonna know how to analyze it. However, if you're working in a capacity like I might work in day job and you're going into the environment and you see that their EDR says like, yeah, look, right before There's they a shut command down, line entry. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're like, oh, okay. Or you'll see Sysmon you just go, oh, that's the password. And then you or the malware team can, you know, do, do your your work essentially. So that's the, the password information. And then you have a general decryption ID. And this ID is unique for each campaign. And this can be used like for affiliate and things of that nature. And that's that's pretty much it. Here you have your different versions. Oftentimes, you'll see the DLLs that are invoked via run DLL32.exe. Otherwise, they'll just simply bring in the exe files and just run them. Uh, so... So that's pretty much it. That's the general, just kind of wanted to go over what the heck some of these builders look like, how common they are. I'm a little perturbed that we didn't get a key in our key server, but that's because I had networking completely disabled, right? That was do a good you, thing. Do you have a snapshot on this virtual machine? Can we detonate the lockbit sample? <laughs> I do. We can. Uh, we did not modify it in any way, shape, or form, did we? That's all right. It doesn't have to be modified. I just want like pure vanilla. Lockbit black, baby. Yep, networking is already disabled. VM escape is hopefully disabled. <laughs> we'll find <laughs> out right now, man. So here, let's just run it. Um, I'll even take it one step further and run it as an administrator. Nice. Do, 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 do. Defender's like, what's going on? <laughs> and already we have, there's some stuff being encrypted. Cool, cool. Um, I'm waiting for the uh, desktop background to change. I don't know if it did already or not. No, not yet. Not yet. Let's just take a look here. Do I have Process Hacker on here? I, it should be right here, actually. Yeah, Process Hacker 2. You know, what the ransomware groups use. Of course. <laughs> I, like, I like this tool. And see, you go away. Uh, there it is right there. It's, it's running. This thing. No rush. You take your time. Lockbit. Yeah, right? Ransomware. Get to it. I'm sorry. I really like, I, I know I'm making light of this and uh, being a little bit jovial, uh, if anything, out of a uh, defense mechanism. Cause like, look, ransomware is uh, a pretty real threat and it can obviously devastate a whole lot of businesses and organizations. But I think uh, this is just wild and crazy. And uh, thank you, Ryan. Really, really appreciate you just kind of like 
pulling back the curtain and and showing people and like literally putting it in front of your eyeballs just how turnkey this is and how it's become this commoditized enterprise marketplace hey partners affiliates folks that are just like you know what run this run this binary like you can be a script kitty in the stupid whatever connotation you want and how you interpret the phrase script kitty uh but it it's so easy it is so free and that's just insane to me <laughs> yes agreed it's it's uh scary it's actually very very scary how easy it is for these things you know to be utilized and for um it looks like here this i'm looking in in memory and process mm. hacker randomly i'm trying to see if maybe it was actually working on some of these uh files that might be showing up. i think it is yeah see Gotcha, just gotcha. Of strings in memory of like there's its uh what it's Still adding it up. files yeah kind of just kind of getting a few of like what's what it's doing you have a pretty uh beefed up virtual machine so it might genuinely be like taking its time turning through files it's not like this is a flat windows 11 install or whatever yes uh, it's actually we can also just do a quick one last final check here and go into maybe like uh bu- 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 performance how's my disk doing Ooh, it's busy it's going. It's doing its thing. <laughs> My disk is busy. Yeah. So it's doing its thing. It's encrypting. Oops. In which case, obviously, and again, yeah, not to make the joke light of like, oops, um, you know, I, again, my my day job is going in and helping people with these situations and they're they're horrible. It sucks. It just absolutely yeah. sucks with what some of these people get hit with. So yeah, not making light of it, but making sure that everyone's aware of just how easy these things really are to build and getting them in your environments is, is not difficult. And that's part of the problem. So yeah, thanks for having me on. And uh, we just going through some of the builder stuff. At some point, maybe we do another video where we talk about uh, the malware analysis side of things. You know, we build a couple things that are just very slightly different, some slight different options. And then we go like, look, you know, we bend dip it and uh, object dump it and pull it up in there and GDB and be like, look at all these cool things and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. That'd be super cool. That'd be awesome. And uh, well, hey, thank you, Ryan. I can't say it again and again. Uh, but if I may ask, you know, what, what, what else is next? What else are you up to? How can folks track you down if they're interested, want to learn a little bit more about all this stuff? I appreciate that. You can find me. I'm on Twitter at RJ underscore chap at RJ underscore chap, which is freaking hilarious because I have never liked to go by the name RJ. My middle name is is Jason. I hate the name RJ. And yet I chose <laughs> my online moniker to be RJ underscore chap. So every once in a while, people are like, hey, RJ. And I'm like, who are you talking to? Oh, shut like, up. oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the name I gave myself. There. Whoops. Anyway, uh, incidentresponse.training is the, the website. But something that I'd love for folks, you know, hopefully if this is out before then it should be, I think maybe June 23rd, 2023 is our SANS Ransomware Summit. It's a free summit. It's virtual. We have a whole day of talks planned. We've got a panel. We're going to have a really cool keynote. Uh, so it's all free. You just go to for528.com slash summit 23 and, uh, cause just come check it out. You know, be part of it. We'll watch some cool talks, ask some questions, get some answers and we'll have fun. Sweet, man. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. man, I hope we'll tune in again next time. Pretty soon. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks cool. for having me on. Thanks. There we go. So now we have the background changed block bit black and I'll just show this movies out of the way. You go away. You go away, and you go over there. Nice. And there's a little readme file in the bottom left. Yeah, go find this for your instructions. You go, okay. Hit me up on uh, these onion links. Ron team gotcha. (laughs) (laughs) 